And this brings us to Ezekiel 39, verses 12 and 13, which reads, The house of Israel will spend seven months burying them in order to cleanse the land. Everyone in Israel will help, for it will be a glorious victory for Israel when I demonstrate my glory on that day, says the sovereign Yahweh. So the phrase, on that day, is a reference to the day of Yahweh, which reinforces the eschatological nature of the passage. We also notice the phrase, when I demonstrate my glory on that day. So for this phrase, Ezekiel is drawing upon and expanding the outcome of Yahweh's victory over Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt at the exodus and crossing of the sea. And in Exodus chapter 14, verses 17 to 18, we read, And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they will charge in after the Israelites. And so this is, uh, again in reference, Israel went through the sea which the Lord had split, and he's telling Moses here that the Egyptians are going to charge in after Israel. So that's what it's talking about there in context. And he goes on to say, My great glory will be displayed through Pharaoh and his troops, his chariots and his charioteers. When my glory is displayed through them, all Egypt will see my glory and know that I am Yahweh. So at that, at that point in history, we notice that at the end of verse 18, he says, All Egypt will see my glory. So when I said Ezekiel is expanding upon this, because in the aftermath of the Lord's victory over Gog and his destruction of Gog and his army, we read that all the nations of the earth would know Yahweh. And so here he's talking about um, demonstrating his glory on that day, and that's going to be a demonstration to all the nations of the world. So it's a much bigger scale than what happened with Pharaoh and the Exodus, but it's very similar thematically. And so verses 14 to 18 says, After seven months, teams of men will be appointed to search the land for skeletons to bury. So the land will be made clean again. Whenever bones are found, a marker will be set up so the burial crews will take them to, to be buried in the Valley of Gog's hordes. There will even be a city named Hamona there. So they will cleanse the land. Son of man, this is what the Lord Yahweh says. Tell every kind of bird and all the wild animals, assemble and come. Gather from all around to my sacrificial feast that I am slaughtering for you, a great feast on the mountains of Israel. You will eat flesh and drink blood. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the earth's princes, rams, lambs, male goats, and all the fattened bulls of Bashan. So one of the key phrases that we're going to expand on is the phrase princes of the earth. So it said that you will drink the blood of the earth's princes. And that phrase in Hebrew is nasi ha'aretz. And as Cook says, that phrase can also mean chieftains of the underworld. So in Ezekiel chapter 32 verse 21, and I'm going to read it out of Young's literal translation, it says, Speak to him, do the gods of the mighty out of the midst of Sheol. And commenting on the word gibberim, which is twice used by Ezekiel here, Cook says, quote, These gibberim are among the ranks of the Rephaim, heroic and royal shades with whom Near Easterners communed in cults of the dead. And that's going to be important here in a minute. Um, so keep, we'll keep that in mind that the Rephaim in the Ugaritic text were summoned to these ritual meals. They, they were summoned out of the underworld to these ritual meals. So Cook goes on to say, Isaiah 26, 13 to 14 expresses trust that enemy Rephaim will not rise from Sheol. The God of Israel has the power to prevent ancestor cults from summoning the Gibberim, end quote. So here Cook is drawing a, um, a close relationship or he's maybe not directly equating, but he's making strong associations between the Gibberim and the Rephaim. As he said, these Gibberim are among the ranks of the Rephaim. So that's why within that quote I read, he seems to be uh, switching back and forth from Rephaim to Gibberim because he's drawing that strong uh, connection here. 
So what we're seeing here is that instead of the Rephaim being the guests at the feast, which was the usual in the Ugaritic texts, they were the ones summoned to partake of these at these feasts. Here, they are themselves the ones being consumed. The bulls of Bashan also brings to mind the demonic. As Cook says, quote, in light of the resonances of Gog's army with the living dead warriors of Sheol, Bashan's associations with the living dead Rephaim are notable, end quote. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 13 says, The whole territory of Bashan used to be called the land of the Rephaim. And the Greek Codex Vaticanus reads Gog instead of Og as the king of Bashan in Deuteronomy 3.1, 3.13 and 4.17. And Psalm 22, which reads as though it was dictated first person singular by Christ himself as he hung on the cross, we read in verse 12 and 13, many bulls surround me, strong ones of Bashan encircle me. So we know that there were not cattle surrounding the cross. The Lord is not speaking here through David about cattle. By the strong ones of Bashan, he is referencing this place of the undead, this place that was one of the entry points to the underworld, this place of, de of strong demonic activity. That's what he's talking about when he says, the strong ones of Bashan encircle me while he's on the cross. This place was a very demonic uh, place, a stronghold um, in the ancient world. In verse 19 and 20, we read, You will eat fat until you are satisfied and drink blood until you are drunk at my sacrificial feast that I have prepared for you. At my table you will eat your fill of horses and riders, of mighty men and all the warriors. This is the declaration of the Lord Yahweh. So there again we see mighty men, which is the Gibberim. So this would be the other place where Ezekiel names them here as the ones being eaten. You will eat the flesh of mighty men and drink the blood of the earth's princes. And we remember from Leviticus that Israel is prohibited from eating fat and drinking blood. For example, Leviticus 3.17 says, This is a permanent statute throughout your generations. Wherever you live, you must not eat any fat or any blood. So Yahweh's command to the animals here emphasizes the unnerving aspect of this ritual. And as Joseph Blinkensop says, quote, as incongruous as it may seem, the Eucharistic language of the New Testament also echoes the language used here. The summons to the Lord's table, eating flesh and drinking blood, and in doing so expresses the eschatological aspect of the Eucharistic meal, end quote. Now, I thought that was very interesting. I'd never heard anything like that in any of the teachings that I'd heard on either, either um, Exodus, no, sorry, um, Ezekiel, 38 and 39, or in any teachings I've ever heard on the Eucharist. Nobody ever draws any kind of relationship between um, the, this passage here in Ezekiel 39 and the Lord's Supper that I'd ever heard. So I thought that was very interesting. In Isaiah 25, verse 6, it says, On this mountain Yahweh of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. So that is the great messianic banquet. But the sacrificial meal that Yahweh has prepared here in Ezekiel 39 is not for human consumption. As we read, Leviticus prohibits it, and no human beings are called when Ezekiel is told to call in the, those who are going to eat. It's the, it's the birds and the beasts. So what we have here in Ezekiel 39 is a reversal of the great messianic banquet.